Hi, my name is Ryan from the Tree Care for Birds and Other Wildlife, and this is our awareness training. You can reach me at bmp at treecareforbirds.com and visit our website at www.treecareforbirds.com where you'll find many resources and documents available. We recommend starting with a document called Preventing Harm to Nesting Birds, which is available in both English and Spanish. The main point that we would like to make with this awareness training is that if you find a nest with eggs or young in it, we recommend that you stop working near the nest. Ultimately, the person who impacts the nest is likely to be held responsible. And you can find nesting wildlife anytime and anywhere, although there are certain times of year and certain locations where it would be more likely. We have our best management practices posted at www.treecareforbirds.com. Today in this awareness training, I'm going to talk about why wildlife are important, define the categories that we use in the best management practices, talk about working within those categories, and how to respond to emergencies. So first let's talk about why wildlife are important. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act was enacted in 1918 and it's a treaty between the US, Canada, Japan, Mexico, and Russia. So all of those countries should have similar laws. Essentially, it says that you can't kill or injure native birds, fledglings, eggs, or active nests. Active nests can be defined in many different ways, but today we'll call it a nest that are occupied of eggs or nestlings, or otherwise essential for the survival of juvenile birds. This would include scaring off parents and leaving the young or eggs to die is the general interpretation of this law. It can have hefty fines and even jail time. Congress is discussing changes, but that won't affect us much here in California because California has similar laws. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act was actually started because of women's hat fashion. So here I have a couple of examples of whole birds or important feathers that, that were used in hats back in the, the 19-teens. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is the most often cited law affecting wildlife in California, although we have several others. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is federal law, and the California Fish and Wildlife Service 3503.5 pertains specifically to raptors, to birds of prey, like hawks and eagles, whereas 3503 is much more general, similar to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Each state has its own animal cruelty laws, and California and the federal government both have separate Endangered Species Act, as well as there is a Federal Eagle Act. So I've arranged them in this way because at the top we have laws that affect relatively few species. There are only two eagles that live in the United States, whereas the bottom would affect many, many animals. Animal cruelty applies to, to essentially everything, as well as how restrictive the laws are. So the Eagle Act and the Endangered Species Act are very restrictive, whereas animal cruelty is not as restrictive. So most birds and nests that have eggs or young in them uh, are legally protected. Some nests are protected even when there are no eggs or young in them, such as uh, raptor nests and endangered species nests. Many other species besides birds have legal protection as well. And the laws are about the outcomes, whether or not the wildlife was impacted. They give very little guidance about what you're allowed to do near these, these wildlife. Wildlife are important to many people in the public. There are over half a million Audubon members in North America, and Americans spent $41 billion on birding in 2011. So even if you're not concerned about law enforcement, perhaps you need to be concerned about negative publicity and our interactions with the public. Finally, I'd like to introduce the idea of bioindicators. So Point Blue is a conservation nonprofit in California, and one of their programs helps landowners manage their oak woodlands. And in order to determine the oak woodland health, this organization, rather than looking at the trees, goes out and looks at 12 bird species. So they know that if they find acorn woodpeckers, that means that there's good oak diversity. And if they find California quail, that means that there's good shrub cover. And each one of these species has a specific role in the ecosystem. And so if wildlife are bioindicators of forest health, 
We would like to see people in the tree care industry be very excited about every young bird or other wildlife leaving the nest in the spring and summer because that shows that we're caring for our urban forests well. We don't see any reason to limit the discussion of the benefits of the urban forest to humans. Let's include wildlife in there as well. Okay, let's define the categories which is going to be important for working within the best management practices. So the best management practices use two criteria for determining the category the breeding season, and the habitat value. So here we have the last page of the best management practices is a pre-work inspection form. And the first part of it helps you determine the habitat value of each site. So if we come up to a site and it looks like this, where we have a river and tall grasses, and we start going through our form, we would say that it's within or adjacent to water bodies and that we have riparian vegetation present. That means that we're most likely in a riparian habitat. But if we come into our work site and it looks more like this, we could go through our form and we could say that there is low impervious surfaces, high plant species diversity, high plant structural diversity, there are many mature dead and dying trees and abundant wildlife present, but also it has relatively high human use and it's far from water bodies. So overall I would say that this is a high value habitat. We may come up to our work site and it may look like this. And when we go to our form, we see that we have high human use, high impervious surfaces, low plant species diversity, low plant structural diversity. We're far from water bodies and we have few mature dead and dying trees and few and no wildlife present. So we would probably classify this as a low habitat value. The other important feature is the breeding season. So here I have some data from near where I live in Santa Clara County, California and it shows pretty clearly that bird breeding happens mostly during the months of, between February and August. And there are two important features of this chart. One is to see that there truly is much more breeding happening during that time period, and two, that there is breeding that happens in every month of the year, so we should always be aware of it. So with those two pieces of information, we can determine what our category is. So if we're in a low habitat value area during the non-breeding season, we'd be in category one. If we're in a low habitat value area in either the breeding season or a high habitat value area in the non-breeding season, we'd be in category two. And for the rest, we'd be in category three. And then what the best management practices do is they suggest how much training might be adequate to handle each of these different situations. So for, to handle a category one situation, awareness training might be appropriate. And we're doing the awareness training right now, so at the end of this video, you should be relatively comfortable working in that situation. For a category two, we recommend a wildlife trained arborist, somebody who has more, more training and specific experience in how to deal with that situation. And then for the extreme situations, we recommend a wildlife biologist um, guide the work. So let's talk about working within the categories. So within the best management practices, there is a flow chart where once you've determined which category you're in, it helps you determine how to go about working in that area. And so the first thing that it recommends is having a contact available for a wildlife biologist and a wildlife rehabilitator. So I recommend taking some time to find a wildlife biologist and wildlife rehabilitator in your area and having their phone number ready when you go out into the field in case you have a problem. I find wildlife biologists and wildlife rehabilitators relatively easy from a web search, um, which I've included here, consulting ecologist, and then the name of your city. Uh, similarly with wildlife rehabilitator, they're normally pretty easy to find from a simple web search, but there's also a website here from, that the California Fish and Wildlife keep a, a list of facilities that do this type of work. And then we recommend a pre-work inspection. So in a pre-work inspection, it's important to scan the sky, trees, ground, shrubs, and branches, to check trunks and branch cavities and holes in the ground, to listen for wildlife sounds, and to look for wildlife flying or running away. And while we're looking at the, in those areas, what we're looking for is nests that may have young or eggs in them, concentrations of white-colored droppings, wildlife exhibiting breeding behavior or carrying sticks and nesting materials, or repeatedly visiting an area. Just because we see wildlife 
we see a bird perched on a tree or a squirrel, doesn't mean that we need to stop working. We need to just be more aware of what of looking for these signs of nesting wildlife. So let's talk a little bit about what nests look like because they come in lots of shapes and sizes. I think everyone's aware of this cup and saucer style nest that we see, but there's also uh, woodpecker cavities that are excavated into trees and branches. We have large platform nests often built by raptors. We have pendulous nests. This one is hanging from the bottom of a palm frond. Hummingbird nests often are cup nests but very, very small. And some birds build nests directly on the side of a building, such as this Phoebe here. So one thing to note is the difference in size scale. So this hawk nest is probably six feet across, whereas this hummingbird nest is probably two inches across. Wildlife live in natural cavities in trees and other buildings and locations. Squirrel nests can often be confused with Bird nests, but are relatively distinctive, often built of these leaves grouped together. And some birds build no nests. They simply lay their eggs essentially right on the ground. And we've included here a nest that may be a couple of years old and is inactive and should pose no, no problem to our, to our work because there are no eggs or young in the nest. Nests can be built in a variety of locations. They can be built up high in the tree, they can be built on the ground, and really everywhere in between, including in dead and dying trees and palm trees. So if you find an active nest, we recommend that you stop working near it and contact a wildlife trained arborist if you see any signs of nesting wildlife. Generally, you can continue working after the young have left the nest. And it's always a good idea to ask advice from someone with more experience, especially a wildlife trained arborist or a wildlife biologist. So if we found this nest here and this branch, let's talk about what the potential impacts might be of some of our work. So if we remove this branch or this tree entirely, that's a clear violation of the law. That's something that's obviously we're not allowed to do. But if we wanted to remove a different branch in this tree, or a tree nearby or a bush underneath it, that's still a possible violation that our work may scare off the adults, leaving the young to die. And so we need to be cognizant of that and try to stay away from this nest as much as possible. And then if we wanted to work on some trees relatively far away, that's very unlikely to impact the nest and to, to be a violation of the law. We recommend everyone who is interested get training, especially uh, one that would qualify as a wildlife trained arborist, and we will post uh, more information about that on the website, treecareforbirds.com. Read and follow the best management practices to the best of your ability, and understand the laws, buffers, and recommendations that they discuss within the best management practices. Let's talk briefly about responding to emergencies. So if there's a health and human safety emergency, it is possible to get approval to remove or relocate an active nest if human life are being threatened. We recommend that a level two risk assessment is done by a track qualified individual and that you contact a wildlife biologist for help in getting the, the permits and permissions required in order to, to remove or relocate this nest. If there is no time and it is a emergency and action must be taken, I would consider taking that action, um, bringing the wildlife to a rehabilitator, and documenting it very well, although I think that the agencies may have a different interpretation of what is an emergency than you do, and I would be very hesitant to do this, only in the most extreme situations. A wildlife emergency is if the wildlife are injured or if the young have been abandoned, their parents aren't coming back and feeding them in the nest. I recommend calling a wildlife rehabilitator and asking them for advice. This does not include nests that are in trees that are scheduled for work. That is not an emergency, and removing those nests and, and the, the wildlife from trees that are scheduled for work is very likely a violation of the law. If you find a nest with eggs or young in it, we recommend that you stop working near the nest and that ultimately the person who impacts the nest is most likely to be held responsible. 
You can find nesting wildlife anytime, anywhere, but there are times and locations where you're more likely to find them. We've posted our best management practice on treecareforbirds.com. We would like to thank all of our funders, but especially our main funders of CAL FIRE and the Britain Fund. And once again, my name is Ryan, and I can be contacted at bmp at treecareforbirds.com. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this awareness training.